The story of Sarah, the wife of Abraham, and Hagar, Sarah's slave, is a tale of a woman who has it all and a woman who has nothing, a have versus a have not. As such, it is partly a story about power. Sarah, or Sarai as she is initially called, is beautiful, the wife of a man to whom God has made astounding promises, that through him all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. These promises lead Sarah and Abraham on some amazing journeys, through which the couple become wealthy and Abraham the leader of a nomadic tribe. Sarah then could be said to have it all. Hagar, on the other hand, is a woman with no power or control over her destiny or what happens to her body. She is used as an instrument through which the couple who own her may have a child. Hagar, in contrast to Sarah, is powerless, possessing nothing. But of course, the story of these two women is not so simple. Sarah does not have it all. She is unable to conceive and so is excluded from the promise that God has made Abraham. She lacks the one thing she and many women yearn for, the ability to conceive and have a child. Wishing to become a mother, Sarai does what was common in the ancient Near East. She instructs her husband to have sex with her slave Hagar, who, unlike Sarai, is blessed with fertility and conceives by Abraham as Sarah has wished. Hagar, in this act, becomes the have next to Sarai's have not. And with this, the tables are turned. She now looks upon Sarai with contempt. We, the reader, feel the full force of Sarai's better anger as she says to Abram, may the wrong done to me be on you. I gave my slave girl to your embrace and when she saw that she had conceived, she looked on me with contempt. May the Lord judge between you and me. Abram, Abram's response is to say the least, underwhelming. Your slave girl is in your power. Do to her as you please. He neither seeks to reassure Sarai, nor to protect Hagar, the mother of his unborn child. This, it seems, is women's business for them to work out between themselves. Sarai's response then is to treat Hagar harshly, so much so that Hagar runs away to the wilderness. She is a pregnant woman in a foreign land with no resources or protection, in a place which represents in biblical narrative a place of great danger. Later, the Israelites will wander for 40 years in the wilderness, and Jesus, after his baptism, is thrown into the wilderness and tempted by Satan. But for Hagar, the wilderness becomes a place of encounter with the Almighty. She is met by the angel of the Lord who reassures her, the Lord hath heard your affliction. Another way of translating the Hebrew word for heard is attended to. Although Abraham has received God's promise to become the father of a great nation, the Lord has attended to the least powerful person in the triangle between Abraham, Sarai and Hagar. This is a reoccurring element in the story of salvation, that God listens to the most vulnerable, the orphan and the widow, and in this case, a pregnant slave girl who has not chosen to be pregnant and has been treated harshly by her mistress. Hagar is Egyptian and is on her way to Shur, near the Egyptian border, so it looks like she is trying to go home. She is near water, and this becomes a place where she encounters God, just as the Israelites did at the Red Sea. 
If we look at this episode in the larger context of the biblical narrative, we can draw a parallel between Hagar's situation and the situation that the Israelites face when they flee Pharaoh's oppressive regime under which they themselves are slaves. When the people of Israel come to Sinai, God instructs them, you shall not wrong or oppress a resident alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall not abuse any widow or orphan. If you do abuse them, when they cry out to me, I will surely heed their cry. And indeed, God shows himself as one who heeds the cry of Hagar, this alien slave. In his response, God promises Hagar, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. This is remarkably similar to the promise God makes Abraham. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, a promise which he repeats to Abraham's son Isaac and grandson Jacob. How radical then that Hagar, a woman, a slave, and an Egyptian is one of only four people to whom God makes such an audacious promise. Moreover, Hagar is told, Behold, thou art with child, and shall bear a son, and shall call his name Ishmael. This is the first annunciation scene in the Bible and bears a striking resemblance to the scene in Luke's Gospel when the angel Gabriel announces to Mary the birth of Jesus. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. Significantly, in the time between the writing of this passage in Genesis and the time when Luke's Gospel was written, a new understanding had arisen of angelic beings. They came to be seen as independent from God, serving as mediators between him and human beings. The angel in Luke's Gospel has a name and is clearly not God himself. In Genesis, the angel of the Lord is indistinguishable from the Lord, leading Hagar to declare, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? So this annunciation scene brings us firmly into the territory of salvation. The language of attending to and hearing the cry of the oppressed reoccurs throughout the story of God's salvation of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt to freedom in the promised land. Hagar's salvation does not, however, bring her freedom from her owners, to whom she is instructed to return. Nor will Ishmael and his people be given their own land. Ishmael will become the ancestor of the Bedouin desert tribes who live on the Israelite borders and who exist in continual conflict with their neighbors. Hagar's salvation lies in her son, whose name Ishmael means in Hebrew, God hears. He then will serve as an ongoing reminder to Hagar that God attended to her in the desert. Uniquely, Hagar names God. She is the only person in the Bible to do so. Other figures, Jacob for example, names the place where they encountered God, but they do not name God to his face. So she named the Lord who spoke to her. You are Elroy, meaning the God who sees me. For Hagar, God is one who comes to her aid when she is in distress. It is a name born out of her private encounter with God. As we seek to meditate upon the story of Sarah and Hagar, it might be worth reflecting on those times when we have felt the nearness of God and asking ourselves what we might name God. You are the God who...
In the next chapter, God speaks again with Abraham and tells him that his wife Sarai is to be renamed Sarah and that he, God, will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her and she will give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Sarah is not privy to these promises and it also seems that Abraham does not trouble himself to tell her. She only learns of these promises when three men appear at their tent and Sarah overhears these men converse with her husband. Her response is understandable. She has passed the menopause and so laughs in disbelief. Like Hagar before her, she converses with God, but their exchange is altogether briefer and she becomes the subject of God's rebuke. Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, shall I bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Sarah can be pointed to as a woman who lacked faith in God's promises. Rather than trusting God, she seeks to engineer the situation so that she might become a mother through her slave girl, Hagar. Like Adam in the garden, when challenged by God, she engages in denial. But God takes her reaction of disbelieving laughter and plays with it. Their son will be called Isaac, meaning laughter. So in unlikely, if not impossible, circumstances, Hagar and Sarah have each become mothers. But this is not the end of their drama. Conflict arises between them once more when Sarah observes the two boys playing and tells Abraham to cast out Hagar, for she does not want Ishmael to inherit along with her son Isaac. Ishmael and Hagar are sent out once more to the desert, and Hagar, in despair, resigns herself to the death of her son. An angel of the Lord appears and opens her eyes so that she is able to see a well of water, and he assures her of his protection. We are told little more about the pair, except that God was with Ishmael, that he lived in the wilderness, and that his mother gets a wife from him from the land of Egypt, her country of birth. So we can assume that she is finally free of Sarah and Abraham. If we look at the story of Sarah and Hagar in the broader context of the Bible, we see that their relationship is almost a prototype for many stories that follow. The stories of the Old Testament, which tell how Israel became a nation with whom God made a special covenant, are often referred to as the patriarchal narratives. God, it seems, makes promises to men, to Abraham initially, but then to his male descendants, Isaac, Jacob, and Moses. Women do not converse directly with God in the way that these men do. Hagar is a notable exception. But a feature of these stories is the way these great men are often the children of mothers who have been barren. Their conception is against the odds. The Abraham-Sarah-Hagar triangle is duplicated in the relationship between Jacob and his wife Rachel, who is initially barren, and his second wife Leah, and again in the relationship between Elkanah and his barren wife Hannah and concubine Peninnah. In all these cases, it is the barren wife who, through divine intervention, becomes the mother of the great son, Isaac, Joseph and Samuel. The woman who is slave or second wife conceives, but her children do not become the means through which the people of Israel would be saved. So what is the place of these women in the story of the people of Israel? Do they merely provide a feminine troubling offshoot of a story, 
a bit of colour and domestic drama? Well, I think not. As many biblical scholars have recently illustrated, it is more accurate to call the patriarchal narratives the ancestral narratives, because the story of these women, their relationships with one another, and the way in which they conceive and bear children is actually part of the fabric of our faith. This year, we celebrate the 400th anniversary of the King James Version of the Bible. The translation of the Bible into English was part of the Reformation and meant the Bible was taken out of the hands of the educated male clerical elite and could be read by ordinary people in their mother tongue. A downside to the Reformation was that Protestants originally objected to the mystical ways of reading scripture where endless layers of meanings were seen. The reformers wanted plain sense accounts which everyone could understand. This, of course, is important, but we should not overlook the Bible as, in essence, a crowd of people talking about their experiences of God. These people who related their experience are often not good people, nor successful people. They are people very much like us, who in their relationships with God and with one another, struggled to see a faithful way forward. Christians believe that God spoke to and through these people, and he continues to speak through them to us by his Holy Spirit. The Bible is really their words, reflecting their views and experiences of God, whilst at the same time being God's word. The writing of the Bible and our reading of the Bible all these centuries later is a collaborative process between God and humanity. This means we approach the Bible not simply as a series of rules for living the good Christian life, but we read and hear it prayerfully as stories which have the power to change us. In this way, rather than making it our task to interpret the Bible, we allow the Bible to interpret us and our stories. If human authors were able to be inspired by the Spirit of God to write scripture, we can appeal to this same spirit in our reading of the Bible so that these words may speak to our hearts. It is here that the story of Sarah and Hagar might be most helpful. Whilst I began by saying that their relationship is a story of a woman who has it all and a woman who has nothing, these two women have a lot in common. They each experience motherhood and come to know the presence of God. Their experience of motherhood brings with it a huge vulnerability, common, I would say, to most mothers. The profound love a mother has for her child is matched by the profound vulnerability she experiences in the face of potentially losing her child or losing control of her child. In a moment, we shall hear Purcell's setting of a poem in which the author imagines what it was like for Mary when Jesus was lost in the temple as a boy. Not knowing where he is, Mary becomes desperate in her fear of what might have befallen her son. This fear echoes, of course, the pain she will feel when he is crucified. Although we are never told what Sarah knew or felt about the fact that Abraham led their son Isaac to be sacrificed, we can imagine that Sarah, like Mary, was familiar with the vulnerability that motherhood involves. Hagar too had to resign herself to the death of her son when she was cast into the desert by Sarah and Abraham. 
these two women then, in their differing ways, represent to us the sort of vulnerability that is needed when we read the Bible. The Dominican Timothy Radcliffe writes, study of scripture invites us to surrender the safe security of the disengaged reader, to lose our mastery, to entrust ourselves to the flow and thrust of a story beyond our control, like the one who, we believe, gave himself into other people's hands so that we might live. So do we allow the story of Sarah and Hagar, with its cruelty, anger, jealousy and joy, to inform our stories? At those times in our lives when we feel like we are cast out into the wilderness, can we let the story of Hagar lead us to expect to encounter God? Do we accept that the lowly and powerless in our world might be the first to encounter God and to name him? How might we learn to hope when it seems laughable to believe that God can deal with the impossibility of us and our situations? And do we know the God who subverts our laughter so that the laughter of comic disbelief becomes the laughter of pure joy? These are just some of the things that the story of Sarah and Hagar invites us to. You will have your own invitation to receive from the Holy Spirit. Receive it with joy.